Hello, everyone. Uh, if there are some people that might be willing to uh, sit on the floor, there is space up here in the front. You might want to do that. There's a few more spaces, although not, not many. There's a few more seats, so feel free to come forward if you'd like. Okay, a few more seats in the middle over here. Okay, let's get started. Welcome to a presentation on creationism, evolution, law, education, and politics. What a great group. Thank you all very much for coming. My name is Don Cardinal. I'm Dean of the College of Educational Studies. And tonight's presentation is a joint effort between the College of Educational Studies, Schmidt College of Science, the School of Law, and the Chancellor's Office. I want to give special thanks to the, the uh, coordinating committee here. So uh, when I list your name, would you please stand? Dr. Roxanne Miller of the College of Educational Studies, Dean Scott Howe, and Danny Bogart from the School of Law. <laughs> How do you do that if you're already standing? OK, maybe raise your hand. Uh, Dean Manas Kafatos and Frank Frisch from the Schmid College of Science. Chancellor Daniele Strupa, who's out of the country right now. Uh, Mark Woodland, Vice President, Strategic Marketing and Communications. And uh, my favorite, if you don't mind, the woman who pulled this whole event together, my assistant, Margie McCoy. And our special guest, and thank you very much, Dr. Eugenie Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott, thank you for coming. <laughs> I'm going to be brief, but I have two announcements for you. One, I'd like to introduce a new member to the Chapman University community, Dr. Brian Alters. And I want to thank uh, Chancellor Strupa for facilitating bringing uh, uh, bringing Brian here, and uh, if I could give you the whole background, which would take far too long, it was just a fascinating event, but it's very important to, uh, to thank uh, uh, Chancellor Strupa for his support in bringing Brian here. Uh, actually, Brian is from uh, McGill University in Canada, and I have a brief bio, and I say brief because if you saw his whole uh, resume, you'll understand that this is brief. Dr. Brian Alters joined the College of Educational Studies faculty this fall as Professor of Education with a joint appointment in the Schmidt College of Science. His background includes simultaneous international appointments at McGill and Harvard Universities, holding the $8 million endowed Tomlinson Chair in Science Education at McGill, receiving a national medal from the Royal Society of Canada. This is equivalent to the, um, in the United States, the National Academy of Sciences that many of you are aware being host of a primetime, nationally broadcast commercial network TV series, and directing three university research and development units. He has published six books, including his, including his bestseller, Defending Evolution, taught thousands of pre-service and in-service teachers, and won McGill University's highest teaching award, the President's Prize for Excellence in Teaching. He has given hundreds of talks uh, worldwide, his work has been reported globally in thousands of articles in media outlets, including, and get ready, Associated Press, The New York Times, Scientific American, Nature, ABC, CNN, CBS, NBC, MTV, and my favorite, the cover story in Rolling Stone. <laughs> Being a specialist in the evolution versus creationism controversy, Dr. Alters has conducted research and authored books on the subject, testified as an expert witness in federal court and other important legal cases on these matters, and is founder and director of the Evolution Education Research Center, created over a decade ago 
between faculties of McGill and Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Brian. Brian Alters to Chapman University. Before I give Brian the mic, because I know if I do, I'm not going to get it back. <laughs> I am proud and honored to welcome the expansion of the Evolution Education Research Center to Chapman University. Together with researchers from Harvard and McGill Universities, Dr. Brian Alters will direct the expanded center. Now, Dr. Brian Alters. Congratulations, Brian. Good morning. Thank you, Dean Cardinal. Okay, this should only take a few hours and then we'll let Jeannie speak. Uh, the Evolution Education Research Center was formed between researchers of Harvard University and McGill University about 11 years ago, and purely coincidentally, except for those who you might think otherwise, uh, Jeannie Scott happened to be at the opening announcement of the center 11 years ago. And truly, it's coincidental, but amazing coincidence. Um, let me show you. We, we've been doing work for the last 11 years, and it's been published all over and talked about and so forth. Most, most of it concerned in evolution and problems with the Christendom world. But we've been going into another area in the last three years, and that's the Muslim world. We do a lot of work, but this area we've been focusing on in the last three years. It's kind of curious what happens in the Muslim world concerning evolution, biological evolution. So we've been studying, these are two researchers here, uh, Anila Ashgar, John Hopkins University. We just stole her back to McGill University, so she's there now. So I came to California. Um, love her, but somebody's got to have the nice weather. Uh, this is Jason Wiles. He's a professor at uh, Syracuse University in the biology department. He was at McGill University, one of my doctoral students. So they're doing a lot of the research, and there are many, many, many other people, but they do the lion's share of the Muslim Islam research. These are the countries we've been researching in. We actually send researchers into the country as long, as well as working with professors in those countries. And um, this is Phil Sadler. He's the representative from Harvard University, does a lot of research. He's head of the science education department at Harvard University. So we do this sort of work, and we'll continue here. Harvard is sort of representing the east coast of the United States. McGill sort of represents the Canadian area. And Chapman University, the west coast of the United States. So very good, yes, great expansion. Thank you, thank you. We think it's wonderful. Ah, the subject is talked about everywhere. It's a popular subject. It's a controversial subject in the general public doesn't matter, Time Magazine, Newsweek, it goes on and on. I like this, I like this one. I put up the New Yorker, not necessarily because I like it, but you notice there's two of every kind of animal there waiting for a boat in the background. <laughs> Just, this one was interesting. This is Harper's, I like this one too because the, uh, the gentleman, the journalist who wrote this one is Darwin's, how many great genies? Great, great, two greats she's holding up. Great, great grandson of Charles Darwin himself. Just, it never ends, it never ends. The great, great grandson's writing about it. So there was a trial a few years ago. Dr. Scott's involved in all sorts of activities. She's the executive director of the National Center for Science Education in the United States for 23 years. I could not, I would be up here literally for an hour listing off all the awards she has won. I'll just give you just a few. The uh, AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, this is the largest umbrella scientific organization on the planet. She has won one of their top medals. Last year, she won the National Academy of Sciences uh, medal. Um, years before that, she's won the first Stephen Jay Gould Award for the, from the Society of the Study of Evolution, one of the world's leading scientific organizations. And it goes on and on and on. I'd have to go page after page. She has eight honorary doctorates. We call her the Octodoc. <laughs> I, I don't know if you should refer to her as that, but we, we do on the inside. So the, the National Center for Science Education does all sorts of things to help teachers, uh, legal cases to a certain extent, all this sort of thing. And th they're behind the scenes of lots, sometimes right in front of the scenes and so forth. The most significant trial in science education in this country in the last quarter century was about intelligent design and evolution. It was a federal case in Pennsylvania. And of course, Jeannie Scott and her team at NCSC were right there in the thick of it from the very beginning to the very end. This is Judge Jones, the federal judge in, in charge of that case. 
Of course, the attor constitutional attorneys were flown in. Months and months and months of preparation, tons of press. Look at the press leaving the building of the federal courthouse. Unbelievable. About what's being taught in, in a science classroom gets this sort of attention. It goes on and on. The trial, if you're quick with math, you've done your numbers. How many days? Ooh, exactly 40. Hmm. Again, another coincidence. Oh, no. Well, what happened at the end of that most important trial just a few years ago? It was determined that intelligent design was, no, by the way, the memoranda, the, the federal judges, when they, they just don't come out with a verdict, they come out with this memorandum opinion, and this one was 139 pages long. And the result was not science whatsoever. Is this important? Oh, yeah, CNN, lead story, break in, here we go. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, a landmark ruling in the battle over religion and science in our schools, the debate over separation of church and state. Plus, the courts intervene in New York City's first transit worker strike in a quarter century. And new information about the plane crash off of Miami Beach will go live to Miami. We begin tonight with a stunning setback for supporters of intelligent design. It's a showdown over religion and science in our public schools. A federal judge in Pennsylvania today ruled that intelligent design cannot be taught in public schools in Dover. Intelligent design theory holds that some kind of supernatural being, not evolution, helped create life on Earth. Bill Tucker reports from outside the courthouse in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Bill? Kitty, the opinion is 139 pages long, but it has a conclusion that you don't have to be a lawyer to understand. Using direct, plain language, Judge Jones ruled that the teaching of intelligent design violates the separation of church and state. In making this decision, the judge wrote, quote, we have addressed the simple question of whether ID is science. We've concluded that it is not. And moreover, that ID cannot uncouple itself from its creationist and thus religious antecedents. The decision is plain and direct because after six weeks of trial, it couldn't have been more clear that intelligent design is really just a marketing slogan for a religious proposition. The judge even stating in his decision that members of the school board lied in court to hide their reasons for instituting their policy of teaching intelligent design. Scientists, educators, and advocates of separation of church and state embraced the decision. This decision is a major victory for science education and a major victory for science. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Eugenie Scott. There's a whole bunch of people here. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for that, those two great introductions. I, rarely am I introduced by CNN. That, that's that's got to be extra. That, that's got to be very special. Um, I will talk a little bit about the Dover trial, which was, of course, a, you know, a key event for NCSC as well as for science education in this country and the creationism and evolution controversy as well. Um, first of all, let me... Um, just mention that uh, I will be talking a lot tonight about the history of the creationism and evolution controversy because that I think is a great way of bringing in all of these issues of, of politics and law and science and religion and everything else. And I will be relying particularly on two uh, authors, uh, Ed Larson, who's at Pepperdine University now. His book, Summer for the Gods, is, I, is just a fabulously good book about the Scopes trial. And also the e extensive scholarship of Ronald Numbers from the University of Wisconsin, whose book, The Creationists, as well as several other uh, scholarly works, have been uh, very educational for us all. But um, the history of my uh, talk today reflects a, the, a, a large number of the factors that influence the creationism and evolution controversy, but I want to particularly talk today about law and politics. Um, one of the sponsors is the law school. That makes a lot of sense, but also because politics is exceedingly important in this controversy. The United States educational system is very decentralized, and it is also, therefore, highly politicized. School boards are elected, 
and elected officials are always looking over their shoulders to see who is voting. And as a result, in the United States, more than just about any place else, we have a school system which, um, in which the people responsible for major decisions are not always paying as close attention to the issues that those of us in education and science and other disciplines would like, but they are looking to see who is voting, so that politicizes the whole process. Similarly, the history of the conflict over the teaching of evolution over the last 60, 80 years is shaped by an interaction between efforts to promote creationism as well as legal constraints imposed by the Constitution. Uh, Ron, um, sorry, um, uh, Ed Larson and Ron Numbers uh, have conveniently divided uh, the history of the creationism and evolution into roughly three time periods. The first one is a period back in the early part of the 20th century in which efforts were made to ban the teaching of evolution. Of course, the Scopes trial was, uh, was emblematic of this effort, and William Jennings Bryan on the left and Clarence Darrow on the right were the most important legal figures and political figures of their day. And uh, you all are familiar with the movie Inherit the Wind, which actually is not really about the Scopes trial, it's about the McCarthy era, but nonetheless, most people's understanding of the Scopes trial comes from the, the play or the movie Inherit the Wind. Um, by the way, if you read Ed Larson's book, it's so much more exciting than even the movie, and the movie's outstanding, so it's worthwhile learning a little bit more about it. But uh, William Jennings Bryan was a very interesting character. Uh, many socially progressive thinkers of his day opposed evolution because they associated evolution, and particularly the idea of natural selection, with a variety of social evils that were the product of social Darwinism. Um, and this was very understandable why in the early part of the 20th century they would believe this. You had dreadful sweatshops, you had child labor, you had terrible exploitation of workers, um, and people like William Jennings Bryan fought against these. Now, Bryan gets gets kind of a bad rap in history. He was a much cooler guy than he is often presented. He wasn't just this Bible-thumping character caricaturized in Inherit the Wind. He was, he'd, he'd get elected in Berkeley any day, okay? He, he, was, he was really all for good uh, progressive causes. But these kinds of, of outrages, like sweatshops and so forth, were justified by uh, capitalists like Ar Andrew Carnegie as being um, perfectly acceptable because that was the natural order of things. Carnegie wrote, uh, and while the law of competition may be sometimes hard for the individual, working in your sweatshop for 10 hours a day, it is best for the race because it ensures the survival of the fittest in every department. So, of course, um, uh, socially progressive thinkers uh, uh, just totally rejected these ideas as uh, being um, uh, very, very bad for society. Actually, the kinds of views that Carnegie expressed were uh, extra to the science, shall we say, that uh, uh, of evolution. Uh, social Darwinism, if you remember your history, is... Uh, related to evolution only by sharing the name Darwin. You see this same history of the association of evolution with social evil being exploited by modern creationists in movies like Ben Stein's Expelled and in several recent books that have claimed that evolution is inherently racist, it's the source of eugenics, Nazism, and the like. It's ironic because back in the 1920s, it was the capitalists that were the real promoters of um, of evolution um, as a, uh, a source for their particular ideology, and the socialists were, uh, were largely against it. In this movie, Expelled, which uh, fortunately turned out to be something of a commercial dud, kind of a boring movie, actually, uh, on their website, they, they were extremely explicit about what this movie is all about. I don't expect you to read the fine print. I've blown it up for you so you can read it more easily. Evolution leads to atheism, leads to eugenics, leads to the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. <laughs> and not only was this the main message of Expelled, but it was poorly done. So, <laughs> uh, like I said, the movie didn't do very well. If you're interested in the movie Expelled, um, 
the uh, website uh, that the National Center for Science Education set up called Expelled Exposed um, does deal with the question of the Nazis and eugenics and so forth and uh, how the distortions of the movie as well as other things. But not to get too much involved in this early history, although I find it fascinating and I, I really love talking about it. Uh, I think, I think to, to attach things like eugenics and, and racism and so forth uh, to evolution, even to evolution by natural selection, is a gross simplification in the best of circumstances. Consider that ideologues are going to seize upon any powerful idea to push their agenda. Science is a set of very powerful ideas, including evolution by natural selection. Capitalists like Carnegie promoted evolution by natural selection to promote capitalism. Um, Wallace was a socialist. He felt that uh, evolution by natural selection, which he of course helped develop, was, was, you know, was, was equally um, uh, appropriately uh, uh, attached to the idea of socialism uh, to promote uh, the better welfare of human beings. Peter Kropotkin argued for anarchy using evolution, and Vernon Kellogg argued for pacifism. Now, if you say, well, evolution is linked to Nazis and eugenics, well, what about all these other things that a powerful scientific idea were linked to? Perhaps it is more worthwhile to go back and take a broader view that ideologues will seize upon whatever powerful idea they can to promote their cause. It is nothing, there's nothing inherent in evolution that promotes any of these ideas, but that ideologues make it so. For all of that, um, uh, there are far more references to Jesus in Mein Kampf than to Darwin. And yet nobody is saying that Nazism is a natural outgrowth of Christianity. That would be rather silly. During Darwin's time, excuse me, during uh, the time of the Scopes trial, the time of the attempts to ban the teaching of evolution, conservative Christians opposed evolution because it contradicted a literal interpretation of the Bible. Um, interestingly enough, biblical literalism is a fairly recent redevelopment, shall we say, in American Christianity. Uh, if you look at German or French or uh, uh, um, uh, Christianity in Great Britain, uh, you do not find the traditions of biblical literalism that you find in American Christianity. Uh, this is largely because the biblical literalist tradition of American conservative Christianity largely was the result of the establishment of a distinctly American form of conservative Protestant Christianity that was established in the 19-teens and the 1920s called fundamentalism. Fundamentalism arose out of a series of booklets called the Twelve Fundamentals produced by some folks associated with Biola. You know, we keep coming back to Southern California in this situation here. And these, uh, the, the Twelve Fundamentals uh, booklets stress the inerrancy of the Bible and they stress the importance of the Bible in, in matters of, of religion and so forth. They weren't especially anti-evolutionary, but the idea that evolution was incompatible with uh, fundamentalism and other forms of conservative Christianity did begin to grow during the 20s and 30s and is now uh, considered uh, to be um, not acceptable by many conservative Christians. So, what is this idea of evolution that is so objectionable? If you're going to understand evolution, you need to understand it the way scientists understand it. And to us, evolution is a three-part idea. There's the big idea of evolution, which is the idea that living things share common ancestors. Living things have descended with modification from common ancestors. Common ancestry is the big idea of evolution. Um, change through time is a com you know is part of this, but you know metamorphosis has changed through time. That's not really getting at the essence of evolution. Common ancestry is really what biological evolution is all about. Sorry, physicists, I'm leaving cosmology out of this. You know, just next time. Um, I'm talking about biological evolution today, but then. The, the, the inference of common ancestry is studied in two ways. One is, to by look, one is by looking at the processes or mechanisms of evolution. Obviously, Darwin's idea of natural selection is exceedingly important in this. But there are other mechanisms of evolution as well, some of them non-selective like drift and so forth. And 
um, all of these various components of evolution go into how we understand this process of descent with modification. Then we also look at the patterns in the, of evolution. How does this tree of life generated by this, um, uh, this uh, descent with modification work? Uh, who's related to whom? Um, what are the uh, uh, ancestral and descendant lineages and so forth and so on? Now what's kind of interesting is that these three components of evolution are all conceptually distinct because the kinds of data and inference that we use to um, come to that conclusion that living things have shared common ancestors are very, very different from the data and inferences that we use to uh, study either the pattern or the process. They're all related, sure, but you know, Darwin came up with his inference of, of natural, of, of uh, common ancestry based upon things like all the various homologies of, of um, an anatomy and, um, and uh, embryology and so forth and so on, and by biogeography, things like that. Today, uh, when um, uh, evolutionary biologists are researching the processes of evolution, they, they rely very strongly upon genetic mechanisms and they lie upon molecular biology and biochemistry, fields that really weren't even existence when Darwin came up with his idea of evolution through natural selection. And the processes and mechanisms of evolution are really studied through these other kinds of, of mechanisms. You know, biogeography isn't going to tell you anything about natural selection. Natural selection per se doesn't tell you anything about the tree of life. Uh, if birds are descended from dinosaurs, it doesn't matter whether it's natural selection or something else that brought it about. So these three aspects of evolution are all conceptually independent. And you really have to understand all three of them if you're really going to understand what evolution is all about. So, um, religious con the social progressives of, Bar of Brian's era were focusing more upon the natural selection mechanism the nature red in tooth and claw, the kinds of things that Andrew Carnegie was blaming, or, or you know, that, that Andrew Carnegie was exploiting uh, in his uh, efforts to justify laissez-faire capitalism. The religious conservatives of Brian's day, back at, at the time of the Scopes trial, were focusing on natural selection, but much, much more so on the idea of common ancestry, because Common ancestry really was very incompatible with the human exceptionalism ideas that were very central to their religious beliefs. Brian made three arguments during the Scopes trial. And when I read these in um, Ed Larson's book many, many years ago, I was struck by how modern they were. Brian said that evolution is unsupported science. Scientists are giving up on evolution. Brian said that evolution is incompatible with Christian faith, and Brian also argued that citizens, not experts, should determine the curriculum. Those of you who follow the uh, science and uh, history standards wars in the great state of Texas might recall school board president Don McLeroy saying a couple of years ago when the science education standards were being developed, someone's got to stand up to experts. <laughs> so. Today, we find these same arguments. At NCSC, for years, we've called them the pillars of creationism, and I was struck by how well they reflect what William Jennings Bryan talked about in 1925. First of all, that evolution is a theory in crisis. Scientists are giving up on evolution. This would come as a real surprise to the people who are sponsoring this talk and from the science department. Uh, it, is, it is a not yet realized by the scientists themselves that science, that evolution is a weak scientific uh, explanation. And of course, the ever popular supposed incompatibility of evolution and Christian religion, this is a very strong component of the creationist argument today. Now, Brian's third argument that um, citizens sh rather than experts should determine the curriculum. If you don't like something, you don't have to have your kid taught it. That is expressed variously today. That component still is there, witnessed on McLeroy in Texas. But it takes a broader, I mean, when we think about the third pillar, we think of it in a slightly broader sense. And this is the fairness idea. The idea that if you're going to teach evolution, well, it's only fair to balance it out by teaching something else. 
And that something else is what I want to talk about for the rest of this uh, presentation. The something else has varied from teach evolution, but balance it out by teaching creationism. And the court spoke on that. And then it was, well, teach evolution, but balance it out by teaching creation science. And the court spoke on that, and that's not constitutional. Well, teach evolution, but balance it out by teaching intelligent design. Did you detect a pattern here? Anyway, um, and we'll talk about all of those options. But getting back to the scope struck, people forget because they just remember the H.L. Mencken and Inherit the Wind version of the uh, uh, Scopes trial, not the real version of the Scopes trial, that uh, Scopes lost. And the anti-evolution laws that Scopes was um, prosecuted under remained on the books for over 30 years thereafter. And the Tennessee an anti-evolution law and that of a couple of other states that passed laws after the Scopes trial in 1925, um, tended to discourage textbook publishers from uh, including evolution in their textbooks. Uh, according to Larson, after about 1930, you would be hard put to find any evolution in a high school textbook. Not because laws said you have to take evolution out, but because textbook publishers just quietly let these passages pass away. The very book that John Scopes taught from, Hunter's Civic Biology, editions passed after, published after 1925 omitted evolution. And it remained this way. Evolution was pretty much out of the high school science curriculum um, until the early 1960s. What happened was in the late 50s, in 1958, the um, Sputniks beat us to space beat the United States to space by putting up the first artificial satellite, the first Sputnik. And this just scared the bejesus out of the uh, uh, American government. Why did the Russians beat the most powerful nation on Earth into space? We've got to beef up our science, our science research, and our science education. Would that those days come again. And so the federal government poured tons of money into science education, one component of which was writing new science textbooks. And these science textbooks in physics and geology and chemistry and biology were all written by professional scientists and master teachers. And when the biology team took a look at what it was passing for biology textbooks, they basically chucked them out, wrote brand new books that stressed inquiry learning that included evolution, which was totally removed, included human reproduction. And th such things as ecology. What a radical thought. And these books became very popular. Other commercial publishers began to clone them, and evolution came back into the science textbooks by approximately the mid to the late 1960s. Well, what this did was um, stimulate the um, um, stimulate a new form of creationism. And there was one more component to that stimulation, and this was a challenge that was brought in 1968 by the, National, by the Arkansas Education Association because one of their books that they had just bought for high school biology teachers to use included evolution, but Arkansas had one of these anti-evolution laws just like John Scopes had been tried under in 1925. And so they thought, well, you know, let's just tidy up the state law because this is obviously a silly law. Who would, you know, who, who in 1968 would think of banning evolution? What a silly idea. And, but, you know, this was a conflict. Should teachers teach what was in the textbook or should they follow the law and skip those pages? So they brought suit and Susan Epperson was a high school teacher at the time who was the plaintiff uh, in this case. And what happened was, much to their amazement, this case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in a case called Epperson versus Arkansas that laws like John Scopes had been tried under, the laws that banned the teaching of evolution were unconstitutional. So that made things considerably easier. The Epperson decision is very interesting. It writes, the First Amendment does not permit the state to require the teaching and learning must be tailored to the principles or prohibitions of any religious sector dogma. The state has no legitimate interest in protecting any or all religions from views distasteful to them. So much for, for uh, uh, citizens rather than experts should you know, decide the curriculum. 
Now, the Supreme Court ruled against the Arkansas law, uh, Arkansas anti-evolution law, because it violated the First Amendment. A little Civics 101, just to remind you of the First Amendment, it has two clauses, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Taken together, these two clauses require that public institutions, like schools, be religiously neutral. You cannot promote religion in the public schools. You cannot inhibit religion in, in public schools. You must be religiously neutral. What the court decided in Epperson and in other court cases that we'll talk about this afternoon, what the court decided was that, in this case, banning the teaching of evolution was really done to promote a particular sectarian religious view, that of the biblical literalist Christians. And therefore, it was unconstitutional. We'll see that same kind of issue arising. Well, without laws against the teaching of, of evolution, more and much worse than that, the fact that evolution was showing up in textbooks all over the country, um, this helped to stimulate in the early and mid-1960s a new movement called creation science. And we can consider this the second period of our history of anti-evolutionism. Now, the creation science was the idea that you could take a biblical literalist point of view and support it with scientific evidence. And there were several organizations that cropped up in the um, 1960s and which continue to crop up today. And they take this, this point of view that um, it is uh, um, uh, possible to support a um, uh, biblical literalist view using science and uh, scientific theory. Um, it was claimed to be an alternative science in this book, Scientific Creationism, which is one of the founding books of the field, there is the claim that the purpose of this book is to treat all of the more pertinent aspects of the subject of origins and do so solely on a scientific basis, no references to the Bible or no religious doctrine, except that they were never able to actually do that. Because if you really look at creation science, it is very clearly a non-scientific point of view in which, for example, the word of God must take first priority and secondly, the observed facts of science. When you are looking at the natural world through the filter of an ideology, you are not doing science. Whether that ideology is religion, whether that ideology is some other kind of ism, uh, it is not science. Now, let me talk just briefly about creation science. Um, the essence of creation science is the Christian doctrine of special creation. The idea that God creates the whole universe, the stars and the galaxies and the planets, the planet Earth, certainly, and living things on planet Earth, pretty much as you see them today. So with living things, God creates the cat kind, and uh, so um, pumas and house cats are really just variation on this, this essentialist, Aristotelian essentialist, or Platonic uh, essentialist idea of the created kind. God made cats to look like cats. Um, they don't look like dogs, and they uh, don't share a common ancestor with dogs. I mean, they're, they're a separate creation. Dogs are separate from them. And obviously, humans are specially created uh, from this standpoint. Now, the, um, um, the idea of creation science is not just special creation, but that this can be supported through science, which actually fails. Um, a good way to think about the difference between special creation and evolution was illustrated quite nicely by the ID creationists in their book, Explore Evolution. Evolution is a tree. Evolution deals with the idea of common ancestry. That's why we talk about the tree of life. We talk a lot about a tree uh, metaphor when we talk about evolution, a branching and splitting of uh, lineages and organisms through time. Special creation is an orchard, okay? In special creation, you have a series of special creations and then branching within that kind, just like house cats and pumas can be part of the cat kind. But there is no common ancestor to these forms, so these are not uh, parallel ideas. Now, the science of creation science is not supported by the evidence. Uh, one of the favorite places of young earth creationists is Grand Canyon. Um, this is an approximately 300 mile long feature with up to 5,000 feet of sediment. It is truly a wonder of the world. Um, the creation science folks claim that the entire Colorado Plateau, um, including the 5,000 feet of Grand Canyon, and then of course, 
several thousand feet thereafter when you get out of the, uh, when you go further up the Grand Canteen. All of this, all of these, these sedimentary deposits, not just in the Colorado Plateau, but all over the world, the Himalayan mountains, everything, was laid down by the debris settling out from Noah's flood. Um, if you want to believe that, fine, but it's really, really difficult for you to find science to support that um, because the evidence of geology is clearly incompatible that the, um, all sedimentary deposits around the planet were the result of instant sedimentation over a period of a year uh, when Noah's floodwaters receded. And certainly that Grand Canyon would be cut within a period of a week is really going some when it comes to actual science. You want to know more about why Grand Canyon is not catastrophically cut, uh, deposited or cut, uh, we have a, an NCSC Grand Canyon trip uh, in the summer, which we discussed the creation science view and the standard view. Uh, here we're looking at a sandstone slab, familiar to some people in this room who've been on that trip, that the creationist claim shows evidence of reptiles escaping from the rising floodwaters. Anyway, we have an awfully good time on that trip. Um, <laughs> The great unconformity is, is another very famous uh, thing, but we don't have time to talk. Now, just another little, little clip on creation science and why scientists uh, don't give it much credibility. Um, on the left, what side is this? this is the right-hand side are a series of human fossils, and the columns of this chart are different creation science proponent books in which they discuss these fossils. Now remember that the special creation point of view is that humans are, separate, are created separately from apes. They did not share a common ancestor. Um, and so any fossil has to be just ape or just human. There cannot be any transitional fossils. But of course, the human fossil lineage, as well as many other species, is chock full of, of, of intermediate fossils. And what's kind of amusing about, I hope you will find it amusing, about the demonstration I'll show you is that even the creationists can't agree on what is all ape or what is all human. So in the case of the uh, first uh, 30, um, what is that? It's, uh, uh, East Rudolph, 1813, one of the um, uh, Homo habilis remains, they all agree this is an ape. This is just an ape. This is not an early hominid, it's just an ape. When it comes to um, the Turkana um, 15,000, the Turkana boy, um, uh, a Nariakotome uh, fossil, beautiful fossil, they pretty much all agree that it's all human, uh, but one of them thinks it's just an ape. Um, but then, you know, then you get into all of these things that show intermediate characteristics, and they have a, even the creationists can't agree on these. So for the Java Homo erectus form, most of them think it's just an ape, some of them think it's human. When you get to the Peking Homo erectus form, well, it's a little bit harder, they're about equally split, they, you know, half of them think it's just ape, half of them think it's just human. None of them can recognize that it's intermediate, right? Because their ideology means special creation has to be either created as an ape or created as a human. They get to something like 1470 and it's just hopeless. Uh, they, they just don't know what to do with this. This is, an, an early, this is another homo, it's an early uh, variety. Um, half and half, eh, we don't know what to do with this. And similarly with uh, 3733, which is related to, uh, it's homo ergaster, if you will, and, and early homo erectus. Um, there are plenty of intermediate fossils, not only in the human lineage, but in others. If your ideology forces you to, pro to push all fossils into a Procrustean bed of one created kind or another, you're gonna have a tough time with evolution. You're gonna have a tough time with science. Another, um, oh, and another thing, uh, another common misconception about human evolution, you can see my, my uh, physical anthropology background is coming out here. Um, there, you know, I keep running into this statement about how Oh, you can put all human remains on one, you know, medium-sized table. Where did they get that idea? Um, this isn't even this isn't even a, a, a sampling of all of the human remains. This is just some of the better preserved crania. And by the way, if you look at that carefully, where would you draw the line between apes and humans? Might be tough. Might be tough. Anyway. Heck, we've got more Homo erectus fossils than we have Tyrannosaurus fossils, but never mind. What you find in the creation science literature is something they, they call the two-model approach. This is the idea that there's only two possibilities. There's either evolution or there's special creation. So 
naturally, logically speaking, and logically it's true, if you wipe out evolution, if evolution is false, then creation, then special creation is true. But of course, that's only true if the premises are true, and of course, the premises are not true. Um, over, over here on the special creation side, you have many alternatives to special creation as interpreted by biblical literalists. Theistic evolution is what, if you went to Catholic school, that's what you learned. Uh, you learned that God created through the process of evolution. That's a very common uh, Christian point of view. But, you know, it's not just Christians who have views about origins. You have world religions. Uh, you have ancient religions that are no longer around anymore, like the ancient Norse or the Greeks or the Romans. You have tribal religions all over the planet. And um, it simply is, is not accurate to say that if you disprove evolution, you therefore have proven special creation because maybe you've proved the Hopi right. You know, and, and so, logically speaking, the two-model approach doesn't work. Keep this in mind, because we're going to get back to it a little bit later on. Okay, so what happened with creation science? An effort was begun in the 1970s and 80s to get creation science taught in local school districts, and also to try to get state laws requiring the teaching of creation science passed. The first one was Arkansas 590, um, which defined creation science and called for the balanced teaching of creation and evolution. This failed in Arkansas Federal District Court, um, but a similar, a similar law was passed in Louisiana, which did go all the way to the Supreme Court. And in Edwards v. Aguilard, 1987, the Supreme Court, uh, not unsurprisingly, struck down the Louisiana Equal Time Law for being unconstitutional. Um, it was clear that creation science was a sectarian religious view. Advocating it in the public school, the Establishment Clause, was unconstitutional. Um, but the Edwards decision did leave a couple of, of wrinkles, shall we say. Uh, in both the um, decision, which was written by Justice Brennan, and also in a dissent written by Justice Scalia. Brennan wrote that teachers, of course, have the... Come on. Come on, Brennan, come up here. Here we go. Teachers wrote, sorry, Brennan wrote, the teachers have the right to teach scientific alternatives to evolution. What evolved very quickly was intelligent design. And in a dissent from the Edwards decision, Justice Scalia wrote that he believed that teachers had every right to teach the evidence against evolution. And those are the two uh, components of the history that I'll be talking about next. Now, the Edwards decision, of course, didn't come up until the late 1980s, but even before Edwards, it was clear that creation science was not going to uh, be able to survive legal challenge. It was clearly too religiously oriented. There's too much discussion of Noah's flood, Noah being a specific religious uh, uh, character. Um, in the early, early to mid-1980s, a group of conservative Christians tried to come up with an alternative to creation science that would be an anti-evolutionary position, but which wouldn't have the, the legal shortcomings of being so obviously religious. And what they came up with eventually became called intelligent design. Um, the, the idea was to focus upon a major component of creation science, which was the design argument, the idea that there's terrific complexity out there in the universe, uh, particularly in biology, and that this complexity could not possibly be explained through natural causes. This was very, very similar to an earlier idea expressed by a 19th century cleric by the name of uh, William Paley. Uh, remember Paley? He's the guy with the rock and the watch. And you know, Okay, so you're walking along a heath and you see a stone and that stone might have as well have been there forever for all you know. It's a perfectly natural st uh, s structure. Uh, there's nothing um, unusual about it whatsoever. It's, it's, it's you know, fine, no big deal. But if you see a pocket watch on a heath, you know because of the complexity of that pocket watch because of all the wires and the springs and the glass and all of the pieces and it's, it's all fit together very cleverly to allow you to tell time. You know because of the complexity of that pocket watch that it, it couldn't just be a natural occurrence. I mean, wires and springs and glass don't just come together and allow you to tell time. That, that would be ludicrous. 
So therefore, he said, if you see a rock, it's no big deal. It's a perfectly natural item. If you see a pocket watch, you know there had to be a watchmaker. That could not be natural. It would be a human artifact. And this idea of looking at things in nature, complex, complex things in biology, as being equivalent to human human-made artifacts is sort of the essence of the argument from design. So what Paley argued is that just as the complexity of a watch made you realize there had to be a watchmaker, so the complexity of something like the vertebrate eye, which has uh, all sorts of layers and um, components and lenses and tissues and liquids and stuff, um, all of which working together allow light into the brain. It's a very complicated structure. Clearly, this could not have been occurred just through natural processes. There must be a god. So the argument from design is an apologetic. It's an argument from the complexity of nature, um, arguing through the analogy of human artifacts, which can be very complex, to the need for the existence of a god to explain complexity in nature. But of course, what Darwin did that was so um, subversive, really, um, was come up with a natural way, which is what natural selection is, a natural way to get complex things in nature without needing the direct hand of God. And of course, it was taking away the direct hand of God that was very offensive to many conservative Christians um, when evolution began to be, teaching again, be taught again in school. Well, let's talk a little bit about modern intelligent design. I like to allow the proponents of ideas to define their views rather than having me define it. So William Dembski is a major spokesperson for intelligent design, and he defines intelligent design as a three-part idea. He says, first of all, it is a scientific research program that investigates the effects of intelligent causes. He also says that it is an intellectual movement that challenges Darwinism and its naturalistic legacy and a way of understanding divine action. Well, now, parts two and three could be very interesting, but they're not scientific, so we're not going to pay any attention to those. Let's just concentrate on what William Dembski says is the scientific aspect of intelligent design. I mean, Dembski himself defines it as partly a religious idea, but let's just look at the science. So if we just look at the science of intelligent design, we find that it basically consists of two ideas. One is an idea promoted by um, Michael Behe um, in his book Darwin's Black Box and subsequent books called Irreducible Complexity. Now, this is the idea that there exists not just really, really complex things in nature like the vertebrate eye or the bacteria flagellum or the blood clotting system, but that these complex structures are complex in a particular way. They are irreducibly complex in the sense that a multi-part system like the 50 parts of a bacteria flagellum, say, could not be brought together one at a time, as he says natural selection requires, because you don't really get a value to all 50 of these um, uh, proteins until you have all of them together at the same time. So like if you had protein one, you couldn't put it together with protein two because there's no selective advantage of just those two proteins together. Similarly, there's no advantage to putting those two proteins and one more together because there's no selective advantage. The only time you get a selective advantage, says Mike, is when the whole shoot and match gets together and then it makes the uh, flagellum of a uh, bacteria move. So that's irreducible complexity. And he says, therefore, when you find things like the bacteria flagellum, we find things that are irreducible complexity in nature, that means that the direct hand of God had to be involved. Now, he doesn't say that. No, he says that you have to have an intelligence. We don't know what the intelligence is. Well, of course we know what the intelligence is. It's a Christian God. All over in the intelligent design literature, it's very clear that the intelligence spells his name with three letters. It's not that hard to figure out from their literature. But you don't get taught in the public schools if you say that God created specially. The courts have been there, done that. So instead, they play this game of you know, hide the pee under the shell and uh, try to pretend that they're not really talking about a religious idea. Just a scientific enterprise, well, you know, loose lips sink ships. If you, you know, actually write about what you, what you really mean, then people will find out what you actually intend. The other scientific idea 
in intelligent design is presented by the aforementioned William Dembski. And this is a probability argument called um, complex specified information or the design inference, which he has expressed in his book, The Design Inference, and some other, uh, uh, many other publications. Now, this is basically the same thing, except instead of talking about great complexity being uh, impossible to put together without intelligence, he's talking about probability. But it's, you know, Dembski will say that. Um, uh, irreducible complexity is really just a subset of his idea. So it, we're basically talking about the same thing. That's it, boys and girls. That is all there is to the scientific aspect of intelligent design. Now, there's something kind of interesting going on. Um, well, well, I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, as science goes, intelligent design is pretty thin. There are quite a few organizations, though, promoting intelligent design, the most prominent being the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. Now, for many years in the 1990s and the early 2000s, the Discovery Institute and other proponents proposed teaching ID in public schools. They published white papers uh, that they posted on their um, uh, blogs and on their website. They published articles in law journals about the legality of teaching uh, intelligent design in the public schools. But interestingly, uh, they shifted their, their strategy by about 2002. It's, I don't know why they actually didn't call me up and tell me. Um, but I suspect that a good deal of their change in strategy away from trying to get intelligent design in the public schools had to do with their realization that, wait a minute, we may have chosen the wrong term for this idea. Intelligent design implies a designer. And sooner or later, some judge is going to say, who is the designer? What is this intelligent agent of whom we speak? So, you know, they, well, it's a little too late. We can't choose a new name. So, okay, okay, so let's not try to get intelligent design into the schools because we're likely to face a, a, a lawsuit and we're, you know, this is not going to go well for us. Too late. Unfortunately, in 2005, the community of, your, of uh, Dover, Pennsylvania, had a school board that had been bound and determined to get creationism in there somehow uh, for several years. And the Dover School Board voted in a policy requiring the teaching of intelligent design. A group of parents in the community decided they really didn't want their kids being taught somebody else's religion, so they asked the ACLU to bring lawsuit. Uh, what happened was the ACLU called us, said, have you heard about Dover? Yeah, we heard about Dover. We've been working with the parents. And um, we put together a legal team, uh, including the ACLU, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, and the um, a member of my legal advisory committee, um, uh, Eric Rothschild, and his colleagues at Pepper Hamilton, which is a big law firm in Philadelphia. And NCSE acted as an advisor for the plaintiff's legal team uh, throughout the preparation of the court materials and the, the very long preparation for the case itself, the many depositions, um, uh, witness statements, is on, on and on, and the actual trial, which Brian mentioned. And Brian was an exceedingly effective expert witness at Kitzmiller versus Dover. He, he was really excellent. Now, the, um, uh, it, was, it was a fascinating trial. Um, intelligent design, although defended as science by its ableist proponents, which were Michael Behe and Scott Minnick, clearly failed to pass muster as science, and it was very, very obvious it was a religious idea. And in fact, the court ruled that intelligent design was not science. And uh, this little gray-haired lady here in the corner is grinning for a very important reason, because if the court had ruled, yeah, it's perfectly fine to teach this stuff, there it would have been Katie bar the door. There were school districts around the country that were just poised to introduce their own intelligent, let's balance evolution with the teaching of intelligent design. There were state legislators around the country who were just poised to introduce intelligent design legislation. So the fact that the judge in Dover, who by the way, was appointed by George W. Bush and is a conservative Republican, this is not an activist judge, boys and girls, okay? The fact that the judge in Dover decided that the teaching of intelligent design was patently unconstitutional stopped a lot of problems for science education in the future. 
Now, it was clear in the mind of the school board members that teaching intelligent design was equivalent to teaching creationism. A critical piece of evidence was from a news report of school board member Mr. William Buckingham. Uh, we were trying to get this to play, but unfortunately, the clip that I have is not really loud enough to be heard. So um, it's a very interesting clip because Mr. Buckingham does say flat out that we really need to balance the teaching of evolution with something else, like creationism. The, the judge uh, didn't like that very much. So uh, it is not constitutional to teach intelligent design. Now, granted, this is only one district in Pennsylvania, and uh, it's not a Supreme Court case. It's only, a, you know, intelligent design has not been tested outside of Pennsylvania. But frankly, I think any school district around the country in which a school board member says, let's have a policy on intelligent design, is going to get a little tap on the shoulder from their uh, legal advisor saying, we should talk about this. Because there is precedent, that there, is, there is a case in Pennsylvania that even if it's not precedent here in Nebraska or here in California, is going to be extremely influential in any court that we uh, are brought to because we are going to get sued over this. You can, you can be confident about that. So I think it's highly unlikely that any other school district around the country is going to bring a Dover-type policy, which is all to the good. Let's talk about that second component of the Edwards versus Aguilar decision, um, which arises out of a dissent from, Calias, from Scalia. Now remember, dissents have no legal um, uh, precedential value. Uh, you can dissent on 95 different subject matters from here to Nebraska, but it's not going to be precedent any place. Uh, dissents uh, can be very important in shaping legal opinions, but they don't hold um, the, the same strength of interpretation as the actual decision itself. But Scalia wrote in his dissent that he felt teachers had the right to teach the evidence against evolution if they wanted to, and this became a rallying cry for the creationists. Immediately after the um, uh, decision in Edwards came down. The Institute for Creation Research published a uh, broadside in their um, uh, pamphlet series in which they said, and I quote, school boards and teachers should be strongly encouraged to stress the scientific evidence, uh, evidences and arguments against evolution, not just against some proposed evolutionary mechanism, but against evolution per se. And this is the, the money quote here even if they don't wish to recognize these as evidences and arguments for creation. Where have we heard this before? This is the old two-model approach. Disprove evolution, and you've proved special creation, you've proved intelligent design, or you've proved the evidence against evolution. All right? You have, sorry, disproving evolution by, by presenting the evidence against, the alleged evidence against evolution is another way of demonstrating creation science, creationism. So this was clear to us as students of this, but it's not necessarily clear to everyone else. The, um, um, uh, the evidence against evolution approach has been one which um, has cropped up in, in many, many places. The first place that it crossed up, that it cropped up, was in um, Ohio in 2002. I mentioned that the Discovery Institute changed its approach from trying to get intelligent design into the classrooms to a different approach, which was really the evidence against evolution approach. Um, and this came up, first of all, on our radar when two uh, Discovery Institute uh, associates, John Wells and Stephen Meyer, proposed during some hearings at the Ohio uh, Board of Education Science Education hearings that um, um, they really you know, didn't want to have intelligent design taught, but the full range of views about evolution be taught. Um, the standard that was uh, developed back then in 2002 was a master of political compromise. It read, describe how scientists continue to investigate and critically analyze aspects of evolutionary theory. Doesn't sound so bad. The scientists said, yeah, this is a good critical thinking, you know, standard. It means that students will be encouraged to um, critically analyze um, aspects of evolutionary theory, you know, like sympatric versus allopatric speciation, or are dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded, or um, as, um, uh, what's another good example? Um, 
how is our Neanderthals ancestral to modern sapiens or not? So, you know, you'll have students really investigating aspects of evolutionary theory. That wasn't how the creationists looked at this at all. Uh, and like I say, the wording of this was, was a master of political compromise. The way the creationists looked at this was ignore the aspects of evolutionary theory. And critically analyze doesn't mean critically analyze in this controversy. Critically analyze means criticize, okay? Uh, you know, you kind of have to know what the, the, the code words mean. Uh, intelligent design leader Philip Johnson was very clear about this. He wrote, the recent decisions of the Ohio Sta Science Standards Committee, some people think it's a compromise, but it isn't. It's our position. It allows teachers to present evidence, evidence against the theory of evolution. So even this very mild sounding, well, this is just critical thinking for kids, this is intended by creationists to bring in the evidence against evolution, which is evidence for creationism. This is a backdoor way of sneaking creationism into the, into the um, uh, curriculum. Very interesting, very interesting. There are many, many euphemisms for this evidence against evolution approach. Critically analyze evidence for evolution as we saw in Ohio, evidence for and evidence against evolution, strengths and weaknesses of evolution that we argued ad nauseum in Texas. Evolution is theory, not fact. I always say, well, of course evolution is theory. Theories explain facts. <laughs> All the scientists chuckle. Uh, we don't have time to talk about that. Um, teach the full range of views about origins. Teach the controversy. All of these are euphemisms for creationism believe it or not, because all of these are ways of saying evolution is crappy science, bring in the evidence against evolution, and what that means is evidence for creationism. This is exactly how these people are looking at this issue. Recall the pillars of creationism. We've seen a decline in emphasis of that second religion pillar, but this but we've seen an increase in attacks upon evolution. The evidence against evolution approach really is the first and the third pillar. It is an attack upon evolution, but it's also stressing the fairness. Critical thinking, you know, don't you want your, raise your hand if you're against critical thinking, right? And of course, nobody's gonna do that. Obviously, everybody wants their kids to be critical thinkers. My hypothesis about this, and of course it's, probably an untestable hypothesis unless I can get some of the intelligent design people out for a, many, many drinks and have them tell me this. But uh, so probably, you know, it's an untestable hypothesis. Scientists hate untestable hypotheses. My hypothesis is that creationists have found that top-down approaches like legislation uh, at a state level or um, policies like Dover's and so forth um, get knocked down by the courts. And yet approaching uh, the teaching of evolution or the teaching of creationism through individual teachers might be a better approach because statistics show that many teachers are sympathetic to teaching creationism, 25 to 30 percent according to some polls. That's scary. Um, so therefore, if you give these people free reign, you're going to get creationism into the schools without having to pass a law like um, Louisiana or Arkansas or something like that. Yet there was a series of court cases in the um, 90s and, and early 2000s in which teachers who tried to bring creationism in were smacked down by the courts on the grounds that the school district had the right to teach the teacher to follow the curriculum. And this was the Pelosa case here in California, the Levate case in Minnesota, the Webster case in Illinois. So. I believe that this is really the, the reasoning behind a series of what are called academic freedom acts that began with a series of bills that began in uh, Alabama in 2004. Now these academic freedom acts that are cropping up all over the country are very different from the old um, uh, ban evolution act or teach creation science alongside acts. These new bits of legislation are protective of teachers. In other words, uh, teachers are protected um, uh, against uh, being told by their school district to knock it off if they bring in creationism. But of course, they're never stated quite that, that baldly. It's encouraged to, in they're intended to encourage the teaching of creationism without actually mentioning the term. Um, one of the um, uh, classic ones was a bill that was 
um, almost got passed in Florida. The Academic Freedom Act brought uh, by Senator, State Senator Storms, which would be lovely to talk about, but a more important one is one that did pass in Louisiana, the Louisiana Academic Freedom Act, which um, is on the books right now and which is definitely problematic for Louisiana teachers. Um, the Academic Freedom Acts uh, are being encouraged through online petitions. Uh, you can go to the site academicfreedomact.org, dot, uh, dot, dot I think, and you can get, um, uh, you can sign a petition to, uh, for a proposed federal law that would basically uh, protect teachers um, uh, from uh, being disciplined by their districts if they bring creationism um, and evidence against evolution and all this kind of stuff into the classroom. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because it it's like they're saying you can have a pass on the Establishment Clause. I don't think that's ever, that's ever really going to be a very attractive idea. Uh, it's wonderful though when you look at these, uh, these bills or these, um, uh, these provisions, uh, I'll show you some of the online examples right now as soon as I find my thingy here. Go. Here we go. It's always couched in terms of freedom of expression, academic freedom, critical thinking, all these really, really positive things. It's, it's really, you know, it's really a brilliant strategy. It's dead wrong when it comes to either the Constitution or good science education, but it's a brilliant stat strategy. Like I say, raise your hand if you're against critical thinking. Hardly anyone is. But the question is, is this really critical thinking in the sense that is good for science education? If I can summarize the um, uh, Academic Freedom Acts and in general this evidence against evolution approach. They avoid religion, they don't mention creationism, cre uh, um, intelligent design, nothing that seems to sound like religion because obviously tr they're trying to avoid the establishment clause. They very much stress free speech. They stress academic freedom, a very positive cultural um, a value in America, uh, but also getting you a little bit away from the Establishment Clause. Um, they tend to be protective bills. They don't say, teacher, go out and do this. They say, teacher, if you go out and do this, it'll be okay. Which is, from a legal standpoint, very, very different for reasons that will become clear. Um, they also tend to be permissive bills um, in, in the I'm sorry, I, I mixed those two up. A protective bill says that if you go out and do this, it'll be okay, you won't get fired, you know, we will, we will protect you from your district or from any other entity. A, the permissive nature of these bills uh, say that you don't have to do it, but if you do it, it's gonna be okay. Now, the reason why that's important, that it's a permissive bill rather than telling a teacher to go out and do it, is that if it's, if it's a bill that, like the Dover bill, says you have to go out and do A, B, and C, that means that a parent or somebody else in the community who wants to stop this practice can go to the judge and say, you know, judge, we want to bring suit. Uh, we think that this is a uh, practice that's going to be injurious to my child who's in the classroom. Uh, you know, the, the person who has standing to bring a suit can, can make this argument. If it's just a permissive bill, it's much more likely that the judge is going to say, well, we don't know for sure. Let's just see how it works out what lawyers refer to as an as-applied challenge, in the sense that you have to actually go out and find that teacher who's teaching creationism, find a student in that class who has a parent of a student who has standing to sue, right now that's two really big flaming hoops to jump through, and then you have to bring your case. And as-applied challenge is much, much more difficult than a facial challenge, than challenging the bill on its face. So the fact that these bills are permissive is very, very clever. And it, it gives them a bit of insulation against the protection that courts have given these issues in the past. So uh, finally, uh, if I can summarize uh, what I have been talking about for the last hour, just about the last hour. Um, we started with creation science and that morphed into intelligent design. Intelligent design gave rise to the post-Edwards versus Aguilard form of uh, anti-evolutionism with which we're dealing today. And that's basically taken two different directions. 
One direction has been the evidence against evolution direction, which has basically two manifestations, the academic freedom protective kinds of act, and the other, the uh, critical thinking, shall we say, um, uh, let us have our students uh, be, you know, pedagogically uh, 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 improved, shall we say, uh, by learning the evidence against evolution as well as evolution. And also the idea of teaching alternative theories, which of course <laughs> means intelligent design. Um, similarly, if you look at the, um, at the evidence against evolution idea, go to the scientists in the biology and geology department at Chapman University and say, you know, Mr. Brown, could I please have a list of the evidence against evolution so I can teach this in my classroom? Uh, they'll look at you like, excuse me? <laughs> what evidence against evolution? I mean, to a, to a biologist, this is sort of like saying, can I please have the evidence against the spherical Earth? Um, makes no sense to us whatsoever. This is speaking uh, an unknown language. It's Klingon. It's an unknown language. Um, Klingon is known to some scientists, actually, but that's something. <laughs> We're such nerds. Um, but, so in order to find the evidence against evolution, you have to go to the proponents of these bills. And if you go to the proponents of evidence against evolution and say, what, you know, what, what's the list of evidence against evolution that a teacher's supposed to introduce into the classroom? Well, by golly, you go back to the same things that they used to call creation science, they used to call intelligent design. It's gaps in the fossil record, natural selection can't do anything important, on and on and on. Same old, same old, been refuted for a really long time. But it makes for a, a most interesting uh, controversy because, you know, the evidence against evolution approach really is creationism through the back door. And I think from a legal standpoint, it's going to be a lot more difficult to deal with when inevitably we have to. You will find lots more information about this at ncse.com. And if you go to this um, news alerts button here, you can sign up for a free uh, Friday uh, electronic newsletter. It's just a few bullets uh, every Friday. You can, you know, follow the links or not as you have time, but it's uh, free and it might, you might find it very interesting. If you go to this news button up here on the ribbon, you'll be taken to the news page. You can sort for California or any other state. You're, look at Texas. It's really entertaining. Um, or you can sort by year if you're interested. This is a really great place if you've got to write a paper on the creation and evolution controversy. There's a lot of good data here. So I would encourage you to check it out. And we are a membership organization, so obviously we would love to have you join and contribute. Uh, our YouTube site has the totally ridiculous title, which one of my staff members came up with, and I don't know why he did, but it's Natsen numeral four science ed. It's horrible. Nobody can remember that. But anyway, if you Google NCSE YouTube, you'll probably get here as well. We have lots of, of good clips there, including some wonderful ones from the Texas Board of Education. And obviously, like all right-minded nonprofits, we have a, a Facebook page, and even the old lady is on the uh, Facebook page. So <laughs> thank you so 